Hello everyone, um, my name is Anna Munster. Welcome to Images of Machine Learning, a two day or two sessions over two days online symposium. Uh, very nice to have you all here with us. Um, I wanted to start by just introducing myself. Um, I work uh, in art, in um, theory, and in education at the University of New South Wales. Um, my uh, fellow researcher, Adrian McKenzie, who's located at the Australian uh, University, National University in Canberra, has also been involved in organising this um, symposium. And I'd also like to thank and introduce you to uh, Charu Matani, who is a research assistant on this project, and Kynan Tan, who you will be introduced to in another capacity later, and to thank them very much for all their help with this symposium. So I'd like to begin today um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, from whom I'm uh, working on today, and that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to welcome any Indigenous, First Nations, Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today to acknowledge uh, their elders, uh, past, present and future, and also to acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. And I just want to say that um, for me today, acknowledging country in these kind of online spaces is really important because um, when we're in these spaces, sometimes we forget that these spaces are only possible because we have basically built infrastructure and equipment and media that um, really relies on and is indebted to the lands and bodies um, that we've extracted, the actual materials that we're transmitting these kinds of practices across um, through. So, um, you know, I just think it's important that we, we remember that um, those, those people are First Nations people and it is their land and their bodies that we've allowed computation to be built upon. Um, having said that, um, I do now want to talk a little bit about um, the theme of the conference before we go to our first speaker. Um, so we've We've really tried to concentrate in this um, symposium on this idea of images of machine learning. And of course, so much computational visualization has been concerned with extracting what we are told are patterns that we can't see, but which machine learners can glean by learning from features in data. It's worthwhile pausing to note that when we think about these kinds of images, we're no longer dealing with any scenarios of their generation or transmission via traceable paths of coding, encoding or decoding. If we want to think about um, and work with computational images today, the terrains of art, culture and media theory will also have to radically recompose and reinvent themselves. And of course, they are doing that. Images of and from machine learning are highly condensed artifacts and operations of images and imagings and imaginings recomposed out of, through and alongside multiferous data and via a multitude of transductions, ranging from the flattening of their variability or dimensionality to their decomposition into pixels, the re-observation of these pixels as arrays, sorting and discrimination according to billions of parameters in relation to trained or untrained unsupervised relations between these parameters and then the representation for our seeing our human eyes through many means and methods of optimization and images for and by machine learners are everywhere in agribusiness where greenhouse vision systems help grow tomatoes in synthesised Tom Cruises on TikToks and somewhat scarily in what Amazon is now calling the age of the industrialization of machine learning vision. Images of machine learning also involve imaginings. Imaginings that all these operations can be smooth or smoothable, will be predictable and increasingly 
In response, I might add to the critical work of race, gender and social justice researchers and advocates, that they might be de-biased from errors in the data. But in the last five years or so, critical AI thought and practice has turned to interrogating and experimenting with such imaginings of machine learning, increasingly calling out their visuality. And here, visuality has been approached via a visual cultural lens as the way of seeing and sociocultural practices co-compose to privilege or to challenge power formations. Insofar as machine learning is concerned, we're seeing much important critique around a hegemonic machine vision. That vision which involves a certain image in which faces, habits, skin, bodies, lived experiences and knowledge communities support the production of certain kinds of subjectivities, historically white, male, educated ones, which dominate the computational milieu. And I'm sure that many of us here today continue to work with this kind of critical understanding of visuality. But what I think is really exciting about the people with, that have uh, offered to come together today and tomorrow to present their work to you is that they are also concerned with what conditions of and for the visual are but also what they might become in different ways using different approaches. They ask questions like, what do the materialities of machine learning images do to vision itself? What and how can we know of such images and their observational assemblages in situ and in operation? How do the changing socio-technical relations that underlie the production of such images make them operative both in those old ways, but also in novel ways. And most importantly, can images of, from, and by machine learners help us see the conditions of machine learning's visuality? As my colleague Adrian McKenzie says in his great book on machine learners, a critical machine learner would learn machine learning to diagram a diagrammatic domain. So there's a lot of seeing and imaging going on there. I think that the artists, makers and thinkers we'll hear from in the next two days are, to paraphrase the artist Olfa Eliasson, probing the complexity of what it might mean to see machine learning seeing and all the problems involved in that kind of um, articulation of the question of machine learning images. In the course of their investigations, they experiment with different sensibilities and they question the kind of equivalences that have been made um, and that are hyped in AI, that it will equal, fall short of, or surpass human intelligence. They do this in purposeful, often eccentric, poetic and challenging ways. And I think you'll hear about very different imagings of machine learning from these presenters. And I really hope rather than knowing what a machine learning image is by the end of these two days, you'll be left with feelings of curiosity. Curiosity for the possibility that we still do not know what an image of machine learning can do. So having said that and framed the kind of ways that we're thinking and um, have invited people to think about um, and present their work, um, I would like to introduce you to our first keynote speaker who um, is coming to you in a very different time zone um, and thank you very much Anna Riddler for staying up late to speak with us. Um, so you'll be accessing Anna's talk through YouTube and as you all know that enables um, a chat stream for you to uh, basically converse with each other and also pose questions while Anna's talking. And um, we have people here, uh, Cheru and Kynan, looking at that stream and they will um, pull out some of those questions at the end of, end of Anna's talk and she will respond to those questions. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce you to Anna Riddler, who is a UK-based artist and researcher today. Um, Anna's work has been exhibited at many institutions um, across the world, Victoria and Albert Museum, the Barbican Centre, 
Pompidou Centre at Ars Electronica, where she gained a um, honorary mention in the Golden Nika Award in 2019. Um, and her recent work is now showing, um, if you happen to be over the other side of the world and in Greece, at the UNAI Festival in Athens. Um, she's received commissions from Salford University, the Photographers Gallery, Opera North, um, and uh, gained grants and commissions from Google Arts and Culture, and recently sold an NFT work for a phenomenal sum <laughs> of money at Sotheby's. Um, she might talk about that a little bit later. She was quite shocked herself. <laughs> um, now, I first met Anna in 2018 when she was completing the work that many of us um, are really familiar with now, which is that trio of works, uh, Myriad, Mosaic, Virus, and Bloom and uh, Viling, um, which I guess we'd call her Tulip Triptych. <laughs> um, and I was lucky enough to meet her at a conference and then um, spend a bit of time talking to her about the processes that she undertakes when she does work um, using GANs in particular. And I immediately sensed when I talk, was talking to Anna that um, what I was kind of coming into contact with was something, a kind of new direction in AI artistic experimentation. Um, and I don't mean that in the sense that her work is cutting edge technologically, although it is, um, but it's not that I mean. I mean, really what I found so fascinating about her work is that she's been consistently interested in the relationships between data materialities, machine learning operations, and the way in which these fold back into how we come to look at and then know and extract knowledge from the work. And for me, Anna's work is just such a beautiful synthesis um, of that exquisitely crafted um, poetic studio approach to imaging um, with a real commitment to research and understanding the history of cultural, political and economic relations of AI to knowledge production. So please join me in welcoming Anna Riddler, whose talk is titled Automated Dreaming Using AI in a Creative Practice. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I'm really excited to be part of this conference and also to work with you because as, as you mentioned, we've kind of been talking on and off um, since uh 2018 and it's just really nice to kind of for it all to come together i'm going to talk um about my artistic practice um and the title uh, the title of the talk is called automating Dream automated dreaming um and i think it is uh, important to kind of i'm going to come back to that word dreaming at the end at the end of the talk because i think for me that's a very loaded term because it implies both kind of humanness and intention and um, consciousness, which I'm not necessarily sure that the processes that I'm using have. Um, I'm gonna talk about what I find really interesting about machine learning um, in a creative practice, how it's kind of, kind of evolved, I suppose, in the kind of years that I've been working with it, and then go through some of my projects, um, including the Tulip projects and some of the more recent things that um, I've been working on. And hopefully, um, yeah, we'll get through all of that and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, I see my practice sitting between the artistic and the scientific. A lot of the time, the way that I work is very science-based. It, it's the same methodology that a scientist might have. Lots of kind of testing, lots of data collection, lots of kind of being very methodical about things. Um, but I am an artist first and foremost. The kind of way that the work manifests itself um, includes kind of installation, generative work, computational photography, writing, sound, um, and a, a broad spectrum of outcomes. But the thing that kind of links all of the pieces together, I would say, is this deep and abiding interest in kind of uh, systems of knowledge and how knowledge is formed and kept. And part of this interest kind of comes in comes into kind of like using new technologies, but then unpicking them and seeing how they're created and what, and looking at how they reach back into the histories of science, for example, and by extension society, and how that, those kind of, those, that reaching back, um, what traces, connotations and associations that brings. For the past four or five years, this has kind of manifested, manifested itself extensively 
um, through the use of machine learning as part of a creative process, as Anna mentioned, not just as a tool, so not just kind of like as a filter to kind of apply to an image, but as a way of working, the way that kind of it, I start the project to the kind of the project kind of coming out. A large part of this um, is constructing the science from the ground up. Um, so I do everything from kind of create the algorithm through to the data. And this allows me to kind of understand and show error states and assumptions and reveal the labor of making whilst inverting the usual process of doing, stuff, doing so. Um, for me, data is key to this. It's a really, really, really important part of my practice. In a way, it's the primary medium that I'm working with. And I don't think of it um, as something cold or sterile or algorithmic, even though to a lot of people, it might kind of uh, be thought of as the kind of images that you're now seeing on the screens, which are some of the more canonical data sets um, that exist in computer vision. For me, data is, is, you know, it's this incredibly human thing, as I said, each piece is a trace of someone's lives, something that existed. And in many ways, I see my role as an artist as kind of almost like that of a detective, kind of looking at all of these traces and reconstructing these things and trying to understand them in different ways. Um, but to kind of start kind of thinking about how that, what is machine learning and how can you use it in a data, in a kind of creative practice. I've done a lot of research into existing data sets. So thinking about these kind of publicly available data sets that are used to benchmark computer vision and machine learning. Um, and I'm primarily interested in those which consist of images or videos for tasks such as object detection, facial recognition, multi-label classification, but you know, there are lots of them others around um, that contain sound, text, physical data, other things. Uh, because the idea of the data set, you can't really kind of talk, I think, about machine learning without talking about the idea of the data set. It's crucial in its functionality. What is contained in the data set becomes the knowledge that the algorithm has in order to construct a world. So that if a data set only has images of cats in it, whatever it's trained on, however the model is constructed, it will only be able to see or create everything as a cat. Um, and so there's this real kind of like opportunity, I think, by working with data sets or interrogating data sets to kind of understand more about what's going on inside of the model. And there are a number of famous data sets that are frequently mined for information in research papers or to use to run or test code. And if you look at the dates um, of these kind of, um, of these data sets, you'll see that they are sometimes 10, sometimes 15 years old, and they don't necessarily reflect the world that we live in now. Once produced, they're very rarely reviewed or updated. And I think this is something that um, is important to kind of remember that people assume because algorithms are running, algorithms and models are using these data sets as, as benchmarks, they'll be constantly refreshed and updated, but this is often not the case. They're, and they're now kind of very, and when they are updated, because there are some famous examples of, of, of data sets kind of realizing that there are problematic things inside of them and trying to then go back and clean clean that. Um, the, fam the, the most famous example of that is ImageNet. After the work of uh, Trevor Paglin and Craig, Kate Crawford, they went back and kind of started to clean all of the categories to do with humans once they realized how racist and how problematic those labels were. Um, uh, but now it's very difficult to find kind of those original data sets in their entirety. So if you want to go back and look at ImageNet, and try to find kind of those problematic labels and those problematic images, it's impossible to do so. Even though there are still models, there are still benchmarks that have been trained using that data that is kind of out in the wild, out in the real world. So despite their importance, um, both to the machine learning community and, as broader, and to broader society as cultural artifacts, nobody is really looking after these data sets. Nobody's, um, archiving them and 
and kind of nobody's kind of keeping them keeping them whole and noting these updates as they happen noting the note noting these problems and how they might be changed and ImageNet, which I mentioned before, which is this hugely canonical data set. Um, the photographer's gallery did an entire year kind of looking at everything inside of it and commissioning artists to kind of respond to it. It's now almost impossible to find in its entirety. It's been offline for over a year with only a thousand categories um, available. And with an account on ImageNet, it's still possible to download some of the images from the original links, but many of the original files have disappeared as they originally came from Flickr photographs. And this means it's now impossible to trace back its 15 years as a data set and to see how things have changed and to see how, how the, what has been in the data set, how that might have affected things in the world outside of the data set. And these data sets, these kind of, are working objects. They kind of degrade and fall apart um, over time. And they're, not, they're incomplete and kind of are subject to the same kind of um, yeah, decay as, as other material things. Um, I kind of also was part of the cohort that was commissioned by the Photographers Gallery to kind of think about what makes a data set and what um, and how ImageNet kind of like and how important ImageNet is is to kind of um, visual data sets. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the connection between a data set and or a training set being becoming this kind of contemporary encyclopedia and making that in connection explicit by kind of going through encyclopedias and trying to make my own um, my own data set through kind of the images that were held within um, old encyclopedias and finding the kind of like short fallings that comes through doing that process and kind of seeing how difficult it is. Because in the process of making an encyclopedia, categories are decided upon um, and various objects are placed within those categories. Um, and both kind of creating an encyclopedia and creating a training set or a data set is the search for a universal system to describe the world. Um, and there are huge problems there, I think, around power relationships, around inclusion, around kind of what is available and who decides. And I think by kind of looking back into the past um, and where the problems with encyclopedias and dictionaries are very well acknowledged and working with it in this more contemporary setting, I was able to highlight some of those things. The other thing that, uh, or the thing that kind of struck me most about doing this is that there is this kind of, there is a significant change though from um, an encyclopedia to a training set where an encyclopedia um, is designed to describe the world from a human to a human, whereas um, data sets really are constructed to share structures and informations of humans to machines. So there is the shift though, then in kind of how information is um, encoded and given where it goes and, uh, and abstracted through the process of constructing a data set because a data set in its purest form um, read by a machine is a list of numbers and incomprehensible to a human. And I think one of the aspects that I find most fascinating, um, and just to kind of very quickly um, go through it, is um, through kind of constructing a data set. And one of the areas where you end up in having a huge amount of control is this kind of um, uh, working with and thinking about um, classification and language. I actually studied English literature um, as my first degree, and I feel many of the things that I find fascinating about machine learning come out of that kind of, um, come from that background of kind of, under, of studying kind of language and how language works and ontologies and meaning, um, because yeah, classification becomes so important when working with these systems. Um, 
and this slide I, I like to I liked the, the next two slides I think really kind of show some of the problems that you get when you when you work with um, classification this is a uh, one of the earliest kind of um, attempts to classify everything in the world it's from a 17th century philosopher named Wilkins who tried to kind of give everything a, a, a category that it could, could um, be put into. He had these 40 broad categories ranging from God, from diseases to stones. And then each of these, these categories could then sub, be subdivided. And for example, for stones, he had vulgar stones, middle price stones, and precious, non-precious, um, and dissolvable and non-dissolvable stones. And the, 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 the classifications get finer and finer um, and the reason why I kind of like it is because it, um, it was then taken by Borges who used it as an inspiration to create, um, his own, um, his own system of classifications, which, um, to describe different animals, which kind of, again, goes into these, these different kind of, you know, those belonging to the emperors and kind of mermaids or sirens, which are somehow different from fabulous creatures. And one of the things that I like about this is that it really highlights the inherent ridiculousness of trying to kind of put everything into a category to try and subdivide the world and how much of it is culturally specific and personal to the person, uh, to the, the one who is um, who is kind of creating the system. And I, I think just kind of like, it is an inherently um, futile task, I think, to try and classify the world. And yet this is something that machine learning is trying to do um, when you look at these canonical data sets or when you look at these kind of like the way that these computer vision systems are being set up. They're trying to take the world and, and reconstruct it through images and through these categories. Um, but this is, and you know, like our lives are built around systems of classification. Um, a book that I find very useful um, is Stour and Bauer and Stars Sorting Things Out, um, which talks about how we consciously and subconsciously classify every day. Um, and it's very embedded about how we go through the world, um, how, you know, you, you're constantly kind of sorting things, you know, read emails, unread emails, dirty dishes, clean dishes, you know, it's how we make sense of the world. And when you're presented with something, it's nearly impossible not to try and classify it in some ways. Um, but, and also from that classification to make inferences. Um, and I think both kind of as humans, but as machines as well, um, but machines as well, this kind of link with classification is also a link with memory. Um, there's been some work done by neuroscientists that show without classification, without language, it's hard to kind of retrieve memories um, from, from, our, from our brain. It kind of shapes how we kind of construct the world. If you talk about a memory, that kind of somehow that sometimes changes the memory through the choice of language that you use and that kind of that that is also happening when we're kind of working with machines the language that we're using to classify then shapes the um the the kind of the concept of that thing uh, within the model um without classification also when you're thinking about models and machines and algorithms there is no memory there's no way to retrieve the information there's no way for it to kind of be useful and so even though it can be deeply problematic and um impossible and kind of funny to kind of like look through and kind of think about these classifications it is something that is essential that we need to do so rather than to not rather than to say we should not classify, but just to be very conscious of the act of classifying and what may or may not be included and how we do it. Because I think a lot of the problems that have arise, that have arisen, have come from thoughtlessness and speed of trying to kind of do these things too quickly without the proper work. Um, 
the algorithms and so to move on from kind of data to kind of talking a little bit more about models and um, algorithms the algorithms that I use and that I'm particularly interested in and that I'm going to be talking about works that are related uh, that I have used this particular algorithm are GANs which are generative adversarial networks. I'm sure most of you know what a GAN is um, but they're this they're this relatively still kind of um, unstable, although I think they have got a lot better. There's more knowledge about how they work, but they're still not that well in, understood. Um, they're this complex iterative process where you have two networks that kind of dance around each other, trying to learn um, to mimic imagery. One tries to learn to mimic imagery that could come from the data set, while the other kind of tries to work out whether it's real or counterfeits over the course of many cycles or epochs. Um, playing now is a video from 2017 um, of a spectrally normalized GAN or a SYNGAN, which is, is, this is ancient in terms of the machine learning world. Um, but to me, and from a science experiment, um, but to me, it's incredibly beautiful, these images that kind of have this meandering dream-like quality to them, results that are kind of recognizable as being real, but still have kind of these small tells that show that they're not. And this was, I think, the first, this was the first time when you kind of started to see artists work with GANs and to kind of really kind of use this kind of weird kind of meandering quality to them. And you can, and the realization that these are not just kind of parts of images that have been stitched together, but images that have been entirely generated um, for what the model thinks should be um, the category in question was something that really, I think, took hold of a lot of people and, and was kind of very inspirational. You start to see a lot of people play about with this and see what it can do. Um, and there was, there's always been this kind of um, language that's been applied to this type of imagery, dreaming, hallucinating. And I think it's, um, I kind of mentioned it a little bit at the start of the talk, I think that there should be some hesitation about as ascribing these very kind of human words that are also linked um, to creativity when talking about these images, because these aren't really two intelligences. These aren't two kind of, um, or at least intelligence as we think of, of as intelligence, but these are um, weights moving about. This is a mathematical statistical process that is happening. And as I mentioned, kind of this is, that was, from 2017. Um, now, the same model with tweaks, with um, with kind of like research, with kind of like um, uh, work, they now produce images that look like this, um, that kind of tells that kind of were so apparent um, in the last kind of video that you made it very obvious that these are, um, non-human generated or kind of like machine generated um, images aren't nearly as clear in um, in this image, although they still are there. You can still see the artifacts. You can still kind of, if you look closely, but it looks much more realistic, um, much more like this could be a regular photograph. There is kind of a, finite amount of time though that these kind of these tells will still exist and they do require a different way of looking at an image a much more intense way of looking at an image if you're trying to see whether it's been how it's been generated and the technology industry which is driving most of the research i would say in this field wants wants realism they want these things to become better and better and you know, this week alone, over 280 papers were uploaded onto archive with new research in this area. And this is what, and this is how the kind of space is going to go. The 
but using this type of model and in fact using machine learning in general can be incredibly energy intensive um, and also require a large amount of hardware to work with the latest models that are being put out by nvidia by google um, require um, up to kind of like 40 gpus sometimes to train something so this also kind of like is a way a, a danger because there will be artists uh, who won't have access to that and who will be locked out by the expense of kind of running these things. And unless you kind of align yourself with an institution, academic or otherwise, it's very difficult to get access to that kind of computational power. It was one of the reasons why I worked and worked with Google and had that grant was so that I could kind of um, attempt to kind of work um, to do run a particular type of model, which I just couldn't afford to by myself. And if you don't have artists, if you don't have researchers uh, coming from outside of um, the machine learning community, playing with these things, experimenting, critiquing them, um, that is hugely problematic for me. And I think the other thing about this kind of movement towards realism in GANs is that you end up with this image, which at first glance could just be a photograph. Um, and so kind of like, if it looks like a photograph, there needs to be a real conceptual reason that you're using something to create it that requires so much more energy, so much more money um, than just a mere photograph. The kind of process of using machine learning then needs to become much more important, I think, to the piece. And in a weird way, I think as this technology gets better, it might become less interesting to use. Um, very quickly, I just kind of also wanted to kind of like talk a little bit about how GANs kind of like, um, how they kind of uh, came into the artistic world, um, for want of a better word, um, and kind of how people originally started to think of them. Because I do think there has been a shift um, over the past kind of couple of years as more and more people are working with them and you're getting much more interesting work come out. Um, but this slide is actually from a research paper by Facebook AI Re uh, Research and Rutgers University from 2018, which trained again to make art that was novel but not too novel. Um, it was trained on a series of images of um, paintings, traditional paintings that came from various different categories. Um, and people, members of the public were asked to judge the results um, without knowing that they were produced by an AI. And um, in many cases, the images that were produced by an AI were considered to be better than those produced by um, humans. But the questions that they asked people, um, to me, were really odd. They kind of asked how complex and how novel these images were. And which is just, just very kind of like a very mathematical and scientific way of approaching what makes a good piece of art. And I think the focus kind of of whether a machine can make art, whether this GAN kind of is producing good art, is always to kind of consider and judge um, the result through the impact of visual parameters. Like, does this look like art? And for me, this ignores so much of what I think um, makes a good piece of art, or what I think about when I make art, um, the concept, the impact of the materials used and how it's displayed and conveyed to an audience. And I often talk about how producing an image using a GAN gives, versus any other way, gives the viewer different experience, expectations, traces, histories, and context to consider. I mean, I've just spent half an hour trying to talk about the various different things that kind of like go into making these systems. And I'm really interested in taking those associations and, and using them in the work to push a work and making the GAN or the training set or the model um, an actor and an agent in the artistic process um, and really kind of harnessing that as part of the work. Um, and I think when kind of, and I think it is possible to do that. And I think 
there are many artists working out in that way but a lot of the time people often think about when they think about GAN work or they think about AI work think of images like this this is the um, computer generated portrait that was sold by um, Christie's um, on behalf of Obvious um, who were actually marketing students they weren't artists at all and I think that tells you a lot about the hype um, that went into this but they kind of took very kind of traditional um, uh, paintings from kind of the National Portrait Gallery and then ran a piece of code, um, just they kind of used it straight out the box uh, to create this and it's it was printed and it was framed and it's got a signature on it and it's kind of using all of these kind of hallmarks of kind of like a traditional art piece and I think that for me, this is like um, a piece that isn't really harnessing what is interesting about these systems. But unfortunately, it's one of the pieces that kind of like has made a lot of money. It sold, you know, like it made half a million dollars. Um, and it did, I think, change a lot of how people behave um, in, in kind of like the community because they, the other kind of reason why this piece is quite notorious is that uh, they use code that belonged um, to Robbie Barrett without kind of crediting him either kind of publicly by name or financially for, for the work that he kind of open sourced. And I think that there is this kind of tension that I noticed uh, that I noticed with, between the art world and the science world, um, where in science there is a drive to open source your work. You want people to read it. You want as many people to use it as possible. You want it to go out in the world. There's you know people are very kind of freely credited on papers when they kind of like help or do anything, versus the art world where things are kind of much more controlled. Um, people tend to kind of like, uh, you know, addition work, kind of keep it closed, don't open source or, you know, and kind of like a very kind of hesitant to kind of like behave in that way. And I think this, you see that through labeling as well. Um, if you look at how computer generated works are displayed in major institutions, it will still normally have just a single author attached to it. And if people have had help, if they've had support, technical help, um, those names won't be there. The Serpentine is actually the exception to this, I think, where they will always list everyone who kind of works on a piece. But I think the art world, and particularly I'm talking about the commercial art world, have this um, idea of kind of like the lone single artist whereas many of the times working with with this you know there are a huge amount of kind of you're building on the knowledge of others and um, for a lot of people like obvious um, they're just kind of taking work that other people have done and slotting it together and that's not to say you can't do interesting things with that but it's very often kind of hidden that kind of process when you kind of look at it in a gallery or how it's presented out to the world Anyway, this is a very long preamble before I start talking about my own work. Um, how do I use this? How, 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 um, it's not just as, as, as I mentioned, it's not just as a process, but, um, and it's like really this full way of working, not just to explore ethical implications of technology, but as a way of pushing my work and exploring ideas that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. This is a short clip um, for the piece that I think I'm most well known for called Mosaic Virus, which draws historical parallels from tulip mania that swept across the Netherlands and Europe in the 1630s to the ongoing speculations around cryptocurrency. I used a GAN to generate each of the stills um, to show this tulip blooming, an updated version um, of the Dutch still life for the 21st century. And the appearance um, of the tulip is controlled by the price of Bitcoin. Mosaic is the name of the virus that causes stripes in tulip petals, uh, which helped uh, create, it helped increase their desirability and helped cause the speculative prices um, at the time of the mania. And in, in it changes kind of like it's, it's linked to the price of Bitcoin. So it changes over time to show how the market fluctuates. And I wanted to kind of, 
use this piece to draw together ideas around capitalism value and the tangible and intangible nature of speculation and collapse from these very different kind of moments in history. Um, and there's kind of a third moment, I suppose, um, that I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of speculation. This is just an install shot. Um, so it's kind of like what it looks like when it's in a gallery, which is that of machine learning, because that we are in kind of like an AI um, bubble at the moment where huge amounts of money are being is being poured into this industry. And so that was that's very much present in the piece as well. So there are really three moments of speculation that happen within it. Um, and one of the other things that I was very interested in doing um, was thinking about kind of uh, how data, how information is visualized. We're so used to kind of seeing stock market data presented in this way. This is from 1933, which is the first time that you kind of get a line chart to describe um, financial information, where you can kind of see the story immediately when you kind of uh, look at it. You know, the price goes up, the price goes down. But I was much more interested to see whether you could use um, to think about how you could tell that narrative in a way that obscures or push it at, or at that story. And because um, when you look at it, it's quite difficult to kind of like tell what's going on um, in terms of kind of the price. You have to really watch it for a long time and notice things. And again, it's kind of changing the way of looking, changing the way of presenting data and reimagining it and recontextualizing it in a very different way. I'm very interested in kind of um, taking traditional methods of kind of recording data and working against it and trying to kind of, um, yeah, as I said, obscure the obvious narrative or, or question how um, that information can be displayed or presented in a different way so that the concept is only revealed after spending long times of period, long time thinking about something and looking at the work and, and making that connection um, afterwards. Um, the other kind of thing that I wanted to do with this piece is to use GANs um, as another way, a really link kind of how GANs work to the subject matter. Um, when I started working, um, the GANs in particular, because this project kind of started in 2000, I suppose in 2017, Kind of like concluded in 2019. I want it, GANs, when I started working in particular, had a tendency uh, to, to seem like they were improving when you were training them um, and then suffer something called mode collapse. So if you look at the learning rate, it would kind of go up and up and up and up and then suddenly collapse. Um, and so if you plot that on a graph, it behaves exactly like um, the markets do in these speculative bubbles. So as the, AI, as the machine learning model was trying to learn kind of what makes a tulip, um, it's collapse that um, kind of like mirrors the ups and downs of speculative bubbles. So as a, a speculative bubble, so as a material, it's echoing its subject matter. So in the very way that it's behaving is conceptually linking to kind of what I'm talking about. I also kind of found another link through kind of thinking about this kind of relationship of data set to eventual image, uh, a strong kind of visual uh, reference for this project was of course kind of the Dutch still life, um, the so-called Vanitas paintings, which illustrate kind of how beauty and treasure are fleeting, which again makes it quite nice for a piece about the stock market. But these pictures kind of contain these traditional kind of um, Dutch still life pictures paintings contain flowers that from spring and summer and autumn and sometimes winter. And for me, and so the painter who would be creating this wouldn't be painting from a, a, from a bouquet of flowers in real life. They would be taking from the sketches that they've, they've already made of these flowers from, um, from kind of drawings from kind of their memories from all of the different kind of flowers that they've observed in the world to kind of then create these these beautiful paintings and for me this process was very reminiscent of what I was talking about before about how a GAN 
where it isn't just repeating something that's in, a, in the training set, but rather taking all of the information to create something that could never exist in the real world. Um, it's kind of, it's not showing an actual flower, but an imagined flower, just like this isn't showing an actual bouquet, but rather an imagined bouquet. And so it, there is this nice connection as well between how these paintings were originally constructed and how the GAN is constructing the image um, um, when it's producing um, the film. And then another connection that I wanted to bring out in the piece um, is that of the iris flower data set, because there's a tradition in machine learning. And because, you know, I'm working with machine learning, so I'm drawing references, not just from art history, but also from the history of machine learning. Um, the iris flower data set or Fisher's um, iris data set is a, a multivariant data set that was introduced um, by the British, British uh, mathematician and biologist Ronald Fisher in 1936. And there's, it's also very interesting kind of thinking about Fisher because he is, um, there's, he's very problematic in terms of eugenics. And I think there are many shadows around the problems that we have with AI and ethics that can be traced right back to kind of like these very, very early data sets that, um, that exist because this data set is a typical, typical test case um, for many statistical classification techniques um, in machine learning and is widely used as a beginner's data set. And what I also love about this is that it's included in the package Scikit-learn, um, which is a widely used machine learning package. And so every time any model, any program um, uses Scikit-learn or imports it, they're also importing this um, IRIS data set. So there are thousands of machines that are running these things around the world, which also somewhere hidden somewhat in like the very, very kind of bowels of the, of the memory of the machine are these flower data sets that sit there unused, but there. And that's like a very nice thing for me that there are these, these things that kind of like are out there. Um, and I wanted to kind of draw that out or kind of, or reference it at least through kind of the work that I'm doing with flowers. Um, and just to kind of, yes, talk a little bit about the process of making, um, because I wanted to reference the, the Dutch aesthetic, the Dutch still life aesthetic, and because of all the problems, all this seems to have gone sideways, um, uh, uh, that kind of like, I think exist if you use someone else's data. I created my, I, I created my own data set, and I do that a lot um, with my projects, not always, but, um, I take all of the photographs. If I don't take the photographs, if I don't manually make the data, I spend a lot of time looking at each piece and examining every single frame, every single thing that I'm doing and making sure that I'm trying to be as ethical as possible about it. I took 10,000 photographs of tulips in the Netherlands. And one of the things that was quite nice about the project was the reason that I stopped wasn't because 10,000 was a nice round number, it is. Um, I stopped because tulip season ended. So even though this is a very, very digital piece, it was driven by the rhythms of nature. And by creating my own data set, it forces me to examine each image and invert the usual process of um, making the things. There's a huge, huge difference between pulling down 10,000 images um, from Google of a certain item and taking those photographs yourself. When you do the latter, you notice, you start to have this um, very, very intimate connection to the data. And the process becomes like craft, repetitive, time consuming, but necessary in order to produce something beautiful. And I think there is this kind of um, maybe um, divide between art and craft and thinking about the data set as craft as something that is anonymous, poorly paid, um, you know, not authored versus the art, the algorithm, um, which is the thing that gets at attention and money. Um, I think there is something there. And there's a real skill, um, I think, to producing a good data set. 
um, and how you can kind of retain the quirks and, and oddities that make um, something interesting by what data you include. If you make something too small, if you don't have enough um, information, the, the, the model will fail. Um, and so when I kind of work, I'm kind of constantly kind of making and testing amounts of smaller data sets to see what comes out. Um, and it becomes this very iterative process by kind of looking at what comes out and then using that to kind of then shape what then goes back into the data set. Um, and it's a very time consuming process and it's a process that is very, very expensive to do as well because you have to buy each of these objects to photograph them you have to kind of have the money you have to have the space you have to have the ability to to do this and so i am working from this very privileged uh, in this very privileged way because i i can do this work um and so it's very easy to say kind of create your own data sets but i do acknowledge that that it's not necessarily as viable um for everyone to do that um and so kind of because I spent all of this time working um, with the data and creating the data set, I decided to make the data set into an artwork. And this was something that I did in 2018. And the artwork is called Myriad Tulips. Um, it's about a 50 square meter installation. You can kind of see a little bit there, um, the scale of it. Um, I deliberately included some of the classifications that I used um, handwriting the labels um, onto the photographs and you can kind of see the shifting of categories even as I wrote them kind of sometimes you can see that I change my mind and cross it out and it's hard to decide when a flower is on a boundary whether it's kind of pale pink or white red or orange and kind of like my labels would adjust according to the time of day or mood or what I'd seen before. And I think by using handwriting, um, it very much emphasizes this human aspect of machine learning, how it isn't, how there are always someone who is making a decision. You might have to go very far back in the chain, but you will always be able to find kind of a person who has decided that this is a red tulip versus an orange tulip. And that this is not always an absolute correct thing. And that even something as simple as a single type of flower is difficult to put into discrete categories. And if it's difficult for a flower, then it's very easy to extrapolate how hard it is to do for um, more complex or complex problems. And I think by kind of looking at it, you can really see that like even the most scientific observation, which I tried to do, pretends presents this kind of tenuous triangulation between sensation, material form, and then translation. Um, I think by making the information physical and by placing it back into the real world, it's very easy to forget in the digital age that information is physical and that the things that kind of you see on a screen once started out in the real world. And by placing things back into physical space, into the real world, people can start to comprehend aspects of data than that they didn't before. So by you have a very different reaction when you have to walk along a long corridor and kind of observe all of these photographs and start to understand the time, the effort, the money, the labor that goes into making these things and just simply scrolling down on a keyboard very conscious that time is running out. So I'm not gonna talk about blooming veiling. Um, and I, I'll very quickly talk about um, two other projects that I've made recently um, that I kind of, I've gone through a similar process um, where I'm trying to link um, technology and history so the NFT that Anna mentioned earlier, I made an NFT earlier this year called the Shell Record, where I spent months collecting shells from the foreshore of the Thames. Um, shells have been used as stores of value and tokens of ritual significance for thousands of years. Before the rise of the modern financial system, they were used as money um, on nearly every continent on earth. And now kind of as cryptocurrencies aim to overturn the paradigm of fiat money, much like metallic coinage tried to or successfully overturned 
the paradigm of shell money it kind of felt appropriate to reach back into that ancient form of value, value and bring it into the future. Um, I spent a long, long time collecting shells. And one of the things that I found was that you could really see how the history of the river, the River Thames, I was working during Corona times, I could only kind of go to places that were near me. Um, so I was working on the, the banks of the River Thames and you could see how the history of the river changed. Um, I was occasionally finding fossils. Um, I'd like there was this one uh, fossil of a sea creature that lived 500 million years ago. I also found lots of oyster shells, which no longer live in the Thames, but were very prevalent kind of 200, 300 years ago. And I also found shells that kind of clearly didn't originate in the Thames, like that were cowries um, and that were testaments to the history of trade that existed in London um, that arrived from places probably like Australia back when um, there were active wharfs on the river. Um, one of the things that I found most interesting by like doing this work and kind of um, finding these shells and observing what that history that was embedded in them was that you can kind of start to see the impact of climate change in a very real way. Um, scientists kind of have noted that shells that have been in the river since Ice Age are now rare, outcompeted and replaced by this massive influx of what they call invasive species. And there's this belief um, that these new shells, these that never existed in the Thames before will become fossil time markers for the Anthropocene. And so this piece was a way to kind of um, create a record of what the, the, the history of the River Thames is now and how that might change in the future. And then very quickly as well, because I do want to have time for questions, um, is a new project um, that I've been working on um, that has just been kind of um, uh, opened in Athens. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm very interested in kind of issues to do with um, measurement and quantification, especially how it relates to the natural world. Um, and I have been thinking a lot recently in my research around um, time and how we use, how we measure time, what it means to measure time and the history of how time has been created because, and I think that also links kind of like to my interest in ideas around money. Both of them are, construct, are constructs that have been created by us, by humans and are not natural phenomenons, but they seem so embedded in how we approach the world. Um, I think um, that particularly with time, it's, the, the history of time is very kind of connected to the history of trade and commercialization. Um, and I'm gonna, if we've got time, I'll talk about it later. But the piece um, that I'm showing is a work called Circadian Bloom, where each screen is a multi-screen work and it's um, being displayed outdoors in Athens at the moment. Each screen shows a particular type of plant that has a chronobiological clock. And that means that it that this particular plant will consistently open and close its flowers at fixed times of the day, um, no matter what happens, so that the piece essentially works like a kind of clock. These plants kind of behave this way regardless of external stimuli. So if you take, for example, a morning glory and move it into permanent darkness, it will still flower in the mornings. Um, if you take a night blooming cactus and expose it to darkness, um, it will still bloom um, like 100% darkness throughout all the time. It will still bloom when it should do, um, which is kind of like in the, the latter periods of the night. The clock is designed to start at dawn and end in dusk and it runs in real time, um, changing daily to reflect the precise longitude and latitude of where it's programmed for. And throughout the day, the imagery of the different flowers kind of evolve in synchronicity with their natural counterparts blooming and closing at the correct time of day. And over time, if this piece was installed for a year, you start to kind of, you'll start to kind of see the natural, the, the natural rhythms occur. And that if you look at it at 8 a.m. in winter, 
um, maybe when it's dark, you'll see something very different if you look at it at 8 a.m. in summer when there would probably be flowers blooming for several hours. And this harks back to an earlier medieval way um, middle, um, uh, from the Middle Ages um, of constructing time by temporal hours, which meant that they would kind of take the hours of available daylight, divide them by 12, so that um, an hour was highly dependent on when or where you were kind of um, where you were when you were constructing it. And I kind of like was very interested in the kind of thinking back to this earlier way of telling time and also thinking about this non-human way of telling time. Um, because I think there are kind of like um, all sorts of things around how we need new language and metaphors to talk about some of the most urgent issues of the day around climate. Um, particularly in if you can kind of think about um, things that kind of sit outside of the systems that have helped create it. And this project is a start of an exploration into this and a way to start to think about these other non-human ways of keeping time. And I will stop there because I've massively gone over. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Anna, um, uh, for, for winding up on time, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Um, look, we do have uh, about 10 minutes for, for questions and there's been quite a few that have come through the, um, the chat. Um, so I'm just going to approach them in their order that they came through um, and I won't make any comments. I'll, I'll let the audience um, uh, listen to you respond. There's been a couple of um, interesting questions that are about um, artists' access to um, to kind of machine learning, um, particularly as you mentioned the fact that you wanted to work with um, with Google so that you could actually access the kind of like massive array of of hardware and computational power that um, is required. Oh, and also just to let you know, there's lots and lots of claps coming up on the chat. Too. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of claps. Um, uh, so the first question came from Adrian McKenzie and um, basically asks, what do you think of and do about the speeding up and scaling up of machine learning? How do you negotiate the power asymmetries in your work? Difficult question there. <laughs> it is a difficult question. And I think it's one that is kind of like, I'm constantly kind of like um, in tension with because there's so much, I mean, I think there are two kind of parts to that. There's the stuff that around kind of um, computational power and how I kind of like work with that. And I'm trying more and more to just work with kind of the systems that I can run on my own machine. I do have a GPU at home and I do um, have renewable energy, but it's still kind of like, I can see my electricity bill go up when I am training models, but I'm trying to kind of work on the scale that I can understand um, so that I can really kind of start to um, build and play with it. Because one of the things that I find when I work uh, with institutions who have kind of like their own systems is that you have you, you very rarely actually get access to stuff. You have to give it to an engineer who will then put it onto their system. And I think that mean, it always means that I have less control over what I'm working with. So I try to kind of work with systems that I can physically kind of manipulate on my machine. Um, I think one of the things that I find um, very overwhelming is this huge kind of um, amount of new things that are constantly coming out. And I think it's very easy to kind of get seduced and kind of just constantly be playing about with the latest technologies and kind of seeing what's, what's going on. And it is fun. And there are things that kind of like, um, but it's trying, and so I think I try to kind of make sure that I fully understand something before I start using it in a project. Um, so that I am aware of kind of like how it works. And I think it's just discipline, I think, of trying to, trying to not get too carried away with things or trying to kind of um, only kind of take the, the most interesting things, but it's, it's difficult because there's so much going on and there's so much exciting things, but then also equally, there are so many things that have existed for 20 years that 
I'm also really interested in looking at at the moment and exploring. So it's just, it's hard. It's something that I haven't quite worked out. Well, there's a couple of questions coming straight off what you just said, actually. <laughs> um, one is from um, Baden Palethorpe, who's an Australian artist. And um, he is asking around this question of institutional access. Um, and all those kinds of barriers that artists face. What do you think about platforms such as Runway ML? Have you tried so, um, using I them? Think, what do you think that's, you know, where do you I, think, I think it's are? like, it's a fantastic way of prototyping. And I think it's a fantastic way of people to kind of like get their hands dirty and kind of like see how these, how, you know, like what the result might be. I think it also depends on your practice. Um, so if you're like, um, and what you're interested in engaging with. I think for me, I don't use Runway ML because you don't have that access to kind of um, that ability to kind of deeply understand kind of what's gone in, how, it, how it's been built. And for me, that's important. For me, that's kind of, um, that's a huge part of kind of like how I make work um, because the process is almost as important as the final artifact. But I think it is a good way to kind of shortcut some of those things and it does um, alleviate some of the problems that kind of exist. So I think it's very dependent on different people's practice and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to say with it. Thank you for that. Um, so, well, that's interesting. You mentioned that you, you're working with things that have been around for 20 years. And we do have a question here about whether there's kind of any merit with working with older GANs at all. Um, uh, and I'm really interested in that because of this question of like, um, you know, going back to um, to media that might have become obsolete, but also this problem of, of not being able to access earlier data sets as well. And Katrina Sluis put a very interesting comment up in the, um, in the chat about um, the fact that they couldn't get an entire um, data set of ImageNet um, uh, when they were trying to use it for the phot photographer's gallery for weeks and weeks and weeks and so she was trying to um, press on the DNA to put it in their um, in their collection <laughs> so other people could use it but you know there's this kind of like the problem of, of accessing older media so just you know have you got any thoughts about using kind of older models or, or access yeah I think kind of using older models I mean I think it goes I'm really interested in kind of like thinking of trying to kind of use existing stuff because the older models tend to be less computationally intensive um, and they still kind of like um, are asking the same questions, I think, depending on, again, it depends what your practice is, it depends what you're trying to do. But one of the things I've also noticed um, is that some of the models, uh, the earlier models, like the Syngam model, the science experiment I showed at the beginning, they don't work anymore. Some of the dependencies just have completely collapsed and it's you can't run them really, um, unless you have like very kind of like, unless you have a Docker container that is set up for it. Um, and so I think the other thing with these technologies, not only are the data set is kind of um, degrading and kind of collapsing over time, but also the kind of models, the kind of um, interdependencies that all these kind of um, machine learning models have, they also kind of um, aren't being maintained and are collapsing. So although I'm very interested in kind of working with earlier, um, some of the very early kind of machine learning models, um, I've also found that kind of some of the recent past, some of the stuff from like 2017, 2016, it's no longer kind of possible to get it up and running again, or at least it's not without a huge amount of work. And I think people, because this still seems like a very new area in many ways, um, people aren't kind of thinking about that recent past and, and maintaining it. Um, I think we've got time for one final question. Um, we had a few follow-ups to that one, but I will just um, ask um, uh, one that is uh, a slightly different to the side, um, and that's from Vanessa Bartlett. And she wanted to, um, she's interested in, in your approach to making data um, as a kind of ethical commitment. Um, and she's interested in whether you want to prompt consideration of data ethics when people look at your works um, and how you think that might might actually sort of manifest or or I mean it's always hard to know what an audience is doing but you know have you had any sort of 
um, feedback from that or, you know, do you have any thoughts about that? So I think when I show the work, um, when I show the machine learning output and the data set is nearby, I think that prompts a connection. Um, some of the time the work is shown without it then you have to start to have very different conversations because uh, the, the, the data kind of really is about the process. It's really about some of these thorny issues around machine learning. And uh, I think by displaying that or by kind of um, making sure that it's shown alongside, I think it, that, that is becoming increasingly important for me um, to make sure that that process is becoming as important like an artistic work as the kind of artifact that comes out and I think that's something that is evolving in my practice that that is becoming more and more shown more and more showcased um, and brought out and I think the more that that happens the more that kind of the data set is kind of discussed in relation to the work um, I think you start to kind of have a stronger conversation around ethics. Yeah, and I mean, I think that also relates back to the question of time because when you're looking at, you know, when I stood in front of that that data set, um, the myriad data set, I mean, I've rarely mu very much thought about the question of labour time, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and of course the ways in which that is all very much caught up within <laughs> the whole assemblage of machine learning and from, you know, human intelligence tasks through to, um, you know, uh, many many kinds of labor so that's also another question of, of temporality kind of wrapped into all that work as well um look Anna I'm aware that um <laughs> that it's very late where you are and that we also need to get to our um our next zoom link <laughs> and um uh, and uh, begin our panels so I'm going to thank you very much for um being part of the symposium and um, I want you to know that people have put emojis of tulips up in the <laughs> chat <laughs> as a way to applaud you <laughs> um, but you know I'm uh, thank you so thank you so much for um, uh, being here today and and sharing your work with us and um, good luck with the next phase of work and I'm very excited to um, be following your work and particularly looking at your the progress for your um, Let Me Dream Again work, which um, I uh, exhort people to go and have a look at. And just very quickly, everybody, um, we have an art portal up on the, um, uh, the Images of Machine Learning Symposium website. Um, and there are links to all the artists and makers here in Symposium and a link to Anna's work and her website. Um, her in earlier encyclopedic work that she was talking about today is the featured work that we've put on the website. So please um, go and have a look at that. Um, so thanks very much, Anna. Um, and just to let everybody know, we are now coming out of YouTube. There'll be a short break um, uh, where we set up the um, tech um, for the other presenters and we will be joining um, in the other Zoom link that you have in your invitation um, for uh, the panel presentations and the performance lecture. So thanks again very much, Anna, and um, we'll see you later. <laughs>